everyone. I'm James Milan and welcome to Talk of the Town and our legislative update, our regular legislative update with State Senator Cindy Friedman. Cindy, as always, a pleasure. Great to see you, James. You're looking well. I hope everybody's safe and, and healthy in your family. Thanks. Uh, yes. Thanks for the thought. And in fact, that is the case. Um, every day, you know, I wake up and I say, hmm, I feel normal and fine. And that's that's something good. And what a crazy time. What yep. a crazy time. And then the rest of my household, same thing. So hopefully it's the same with you. Yep. I feel we're healthy and I feel very lucky. Good. Healthy, lucky, and I imagine exhausted. <laughs> um, and uh, we're about to find out why, or at least some, <laughs> some about why. Um, you know, before we even uh, went on air here, I was asking you about, um, you know, whether we're going to be able to talk about anything that isn't basically directly related to COVID-19. And, and, you know, we'll see, I guess, is, uh, is where what we concluded, because it's, it's hard to, again, see beyond everything that is going on now. So let's tackle things um, in kind of random, you know, random order of some sort. Um, one of the things that I'd like to ask about is, obviously, we are uh, speaking on uh, May 20th. So the governor's announcement about a phased reopening of the economy here in Massachusetts is a, a couple of days, came out a couple of days ago. Um, what can you tell us about that in terms of, you know, what, what your own sense of it is and what the, you know, what some of the pertinent details are? My sense, <clears throat> excuse me, my sense of it is that um, the governor, the legislature um, are walking a very fine line <clears throat> between um, doing, uh, you know, what maybe every scientist or most scientists would say, which is don't go anywhere, stay at home, and acknowledging the reality that people have to get back to work and that um, there's rents to be paid and food to be put on the table. And at the same time, this virus is so unknown and still spreading um, in very disturbing ways um, that it's hard to find that middle ground. Um, I think he's trying very hard. I think we're all trying very hard. There are gonna be people that are gonna hate us for letting anything open and they're going to be people who are going to hate us because we're not letting everything open. It's a no-win situation and there's no answer. Um, we don't know. This is the unknown. And so I think the notion of proceeding with caution but proceeding is probably the best course. Now having said that, there's an awful lot of questions and concerns about the opening. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's, you know, to, to begin with, whether there's anything that just surprised you uh, about either the sequence of things or, you know, in any other way where you would have, you were thinking, hmm, um, or whether kind of in general acknowledging the uncertainty that looms over everything, uh, you feel like, okay, this all makes sense. There were a couple things that I noticed um early on when I, you know, when I saw the plan. Um, it's very, very business focused. It's very oriented toward businesses and employers. And I think that that's important because we got to get businesses open. But I did not feel the same focus on employees and how employees are going to be um, protected or taken care of. Um, or, or acknowledging the realities for many employees, like how do you get to work? Um, how do you get to work safely? What happens if you live in a multi-generational family? What happens if you get sick at work? Do you have to pay to stay home? Do they keep your job for, you know, for a certain amount of time? Um, how do we know that uh, people are being protected or that plans are being followed? And so I would have liked to see more focus on both the employer and the employee. And I, I, I'm concerned around that, especially for people who are going into work, to, can't work from home, um, have uh, our low wage workers who are doing all of the incredibly vital 
work of the Commonwealth, like taking care of, you know, my grandmother and my mother and keeping our streets clean and, you know, um, uh, uh, um, hospital cleanup, all of those, you know, um, uh, nurse, you know, not nurse practitioners, but, you know, CNAs and, uh, or CPAs. Right, just everybody just kind Whatever. of. Everybody, right? And we need them. And so. Yeah, I'm kind of desperately, about, in, in, in yeah. fact. Um, yeah, not, it was, it, it, I, I just wonder whether you might have been struck by this. I was. Um, you know, here we are in Massachusetts. Charlie Baker, very, po very um, uh, popular governor, has been for several years. Um, we have this tradition of Republican governors with Democratic legislatures, and and things seem to work generally fine, et cetera. Um, this seems to be one of those instances in which I I agree. Um, the plan looks very business um, focused and business centric, and that sounds. Republican to me versus, you know, a concern about uh, the workers and the conditions uh, in, in which people are going to be both transporting themselves and then and then and then working. Um, I don't usually see a dichotomy like that or recognize that um, for myself. I'm wondering, first of all, I guess if you agree, but also is there a role? So the governor has rolled out his plan. What is the role of the legislature now? Um, if, for instance, you want to um, amend or in some way influence that, that plan um, in order to kind of reorient that balance between uh, business and, 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 and workers. The, the legislature has oversight responsibilities, right? So we, we, have, we can have an oversight hearing, we can, um, we can ask a lot of questions we can um and we can pass legislation we can say you know any uh opening plan must include a b and c i mean the, that is our role that has not gone away even though he has a you know has a lot of um authority over a state of emergency he we still are a uh you know, an equal branch of government, and we we have the authority to overrule this if we were if we want it. You know, I'm mm -hmm. not saying we should. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other area that is really up in the air and is very concerning is the whole issue around childcare. Not only childcare for young children, but childcare for elementary school children. And how do you bring people back to work? without a very robust childcare system. You can't. And I think there's a lot of questions around um, how that's going to be addressed. And I know that that's something that the Senate is really focusing on right now, is what do we need to do around childcare? Because you just can't have work without, you can't have one without the other, can't have work without childcare. Yeah, I think I, I, you say the words, and I think uh, maybe others are going to react like I do, which is, of course, um, but I wasn't thinking about that right. beforehand. You know what I mean? You look through the plan, et cetera, and you forget, wait a minute, um, there's no way people are going to be leaving up to elementary school children right. at, at the very least, right. um, you know, at home alone. alone. I mean, yeah. okay. Not gonna happen. So yeah, I mean, obviously, if there has not been enough consideration of that yet, um, things can't, does, doesn't seem like other things could move forward without that. Right. So those are just two of the areas that I, you know, I have focused on. I feel pretty um, comfortable at this moment for how healthcare is being addressed and how we're going to open it up and what the the markers are uh, for whether or not um, we have the capacity to treat um, the virus if it surges or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been a lot of good thought around that and um, I think the hospitals have shown that they can be very responsive and so <clears throat> we just make sure we need to make sure those markers and that uh, capacity is still in place. Um, another thing that, that that's come to our attention in the last week or so and this this related to a uh, an op-ed that uh, that I read in in, in the Globe um, 
uh, concerns the the alacrity, you know, the the promptness. It seemed, uh, at least according to the writer, with which Governor Baker had addressed uh, or had provided uh, cover, in a sense, for nursing homes and hospitals. Um, you know, kind of uh, giving them some protections against uh, civil liability, um, kind of lawsuits, etc. Um, while seemingly um, not uh, taking into account uh, as much uh, protections for, you know, nursing home residents and their families and folks like that. So just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that whole kind of stream of, of, um, of policy making. This is an example of a really, really difficult decision. The issue was that in order to bring people uh, healthcare workers back into the system that had left, they had recently retired, or they were from another state, or um, nursing homes being able to take people who were COVID-19, had been COVID-19 positive. Um, there were a whole issues around liability. Uh, people coming back into the system don't have, um, you know, they don't have liability insurance, right? Malpractice insurance. So how do you get them in if they're, they want to come and they want to help, but they're worried if something happens on their watch or you're asking a cardiac surgeon to be in the ICU, you know, we want that person to be there. Right. Right. They're saying, listen, I want to be there, but I need some protection because I'm not protected from this. So it was really important that, um, that those protections for the healthcare workers be in place. Um, now, having said that, at the same time, we, we changed the crisis of care standards so that they were much more um, prescriptive and, and much less uh, punitive against people that had pre-existing conditions. So that was very helpful because when those standards of care are in place, it means you need to follow these steps. So there was a protection there. The other piece that we did that I think is really important is all of the, we put an additional $130 million into nursing homes and we set up a very stringent set of requirements that they must follow if they want to continue to get funding. So I think having done those, those uh, two things at the same time that we uh, put in the liability protection is helpful to addressing the issues that some people had. But again, it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Right, but that's a, you know, it's a tried and true formula, as you said, what, you know, extending the carrot of, of the funding of the money and, right. uh, you know, and, and, and extracting some, some uh, compliance in, right. in the process. Um, that makes sense. Um, you know, I want to ask it now, I want to get a little bit more into kind of the nitty gritty of cer certain numbers that people are going to be very concerned about here in Arlington and, and throughout the state. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge, number one, as I am trying to keep up with this stuff, I'm noticing that the numbers are changing all the time, not just the numbers of, not just related to, the co to COVID-19 and the actual um, safety numbers and morbidity and all that stuff. Um, but but even numbers about projected deficits, et cetera. So sticking with the economy for the moment um, and acknowledging that we don't want to hold you to any, you know, to either a firm grasp on whatever these shifting numbers are right now or to the fact of that staying the case, you know, a week from now. Um, I understand that your website is a good place to direct people to get the latest information in a whole host of areas. So first, tell us a little bit about what they can find there, and then we can dig into the numbers a bit. Sure, so my website, uh, cindyfriedman.org, has on it at the, the uh, front page, has a tab for coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. We have uh, put together a whole um, section uh, broken down by uh, different areas. So federal government, um, the legislature, what we've done, the latest updates from DPH, um, all of the relevant information as we get it 
we put it up on the website. I have a phenomenal, phenomenal communications director who keeps all of this up to date. So I encourage everybody to go there and you will see great links to information. Um, and we keep it up to date constantly, daily. So that's a great place um, to go. And I encourage everyone uh, to, to check it out. Um, I'm really, really jealous of people who keep numbers in my head. My brother can remember who, who was at bat in 1952, you know, <laughs> when the Yankees were playing, you know, the Phillies in some game. I know they're two different. <laughs> um, you know, and who is it bad and what his batting average was, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm so jealous of people. I am so not that person. So I have to keep going back to my notes and saying, yes, it was this amount of money. Um, and one number replaces the other as mm -hmm. I get them. So I, I, that's my disclaimer. There you it. go. That's a, that's a very good one. It kind of the, the, the covers plenty of ground. Right. Um, so let's try. Let, let's sure. see. Let's see. I mean, there's some big numbers that, yeah. that we need to deal with. And that is uh, the the projections for the deficits here in in the state of, in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have run in the last week, from what I understand, everywhere from four million, four billion, excuse me, to six billion, possibly eight billion. Um, obviously, we don't know. We understand that. But there are clear implications, especially because we're supposed to be in the middle of a budget process right now, um, and clear implications for towns and cities throughout the Commonwealth, just like Arlington. I know you guys are under a lot of pressure to come up with some numbers so that uh, then municipalities can, you know, get with their own budgets. So what can you, you know, give us your sense of where things are, best sense of where things are at the moment, possibly where things might be headed. Okay, uh, so first of all, there's two, two numbers going on right now. We just did a borrowing bill uh, that gave the state the authority to borrow money for this year, 2020. We are not getting any tax revenue because it's all been um, pushed out till July 15th. So uh, none of those tax, uh, those receipts have come in. So this borrowing bill allows us to borrow against those receipts. And I think that's one of the numbers that we're hearing. But um, the other numbers that are fluctuating are what does the deficit look like for 2021? And it started out at 4 billion. Now there's really some, you know, when you, you look at all the potential areas of revenue, we're now, I think the, um, the economists are saying it's around $6 billion dollar deficit. Um, I know we just did a uh, release to cities and towns uh, the governor just released um, uh, money for cities and towns. I think Arlington's getting, um, I don't know, you know, but Arlington will get a certain amount of that money. And it can be used for coronavirus types of things, boards of health, food insecurity, so, um, just to support the cities and towns while we go, while we're going through this epidemic at this point. Mm -hmm. And that information is, is on the website. Um, so really it is what's it going to look like next year. And number one, as you said, nobody knows. A lot of this depends on what the federal government does or doesn't do. So the numbers fluctuate based on what, what people feel is going to come from the federal, the feds. And, um, this is the real unknown. Um, it's going to be very hard there's going to be there are absolutely going to be deficits there will be a big deficit um where it is in those billion dollar range i think is is people's best guess but it's going to be it's going to be bad mm -hmm. um our job is going to be to figure out where that money needs to go um you know what kind of cuts we make what kinds of um, programs we keep whole and my focus is going to be on ensuring that we protect as many of our residents um, while we're going through this difficult time. So we need to do anything we can to make sure people have food security, make sure that they, you know, that they can stay in their homes um, while we're rebuilding our economy, make sure health care is accessible so people don't get um, uh, sicker, um, 
these are all not only moral and ethical um, issues, but they're also economic, right? Um, because in the, in the end, or very soon, we're going to be paying much more for people because of social instabilities or um, social determinants than we would have if we took care of these issues up front. Do we have a good primary care system? You know, can people get to the hospital? Can kids get their vaccines? These are all really important to keeping our economy going. And at the same time, I think we've got to really focus on what barriers can we move out of the way so businesses can do their jobs? A great example of this is the issues going on around um, whether a restaurant can serve alcohol outside. Mm -hmm. It turns out that no, no, not only do you need local approval, but you need the Alcohol um, Control Commission's approval. Now that's, to me, really, really silly. We want to support our businesses. Right. They want to put up a couple tables outside and the town is okay with that. Let's let them do it. So I think those are the areas that we have to focus on is how do we move barriers out of the way of people doing business and how do we protect our most vulnerable? Yeah, I want to recognize that a lot of the work that you've described both in our last interview, um, and by the way, congratulations, you are the first person for us to do a repeat interview by the, by zoom wow what a distinction oh my god um, but even remembering the 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 last time there is a this theme that obviously we need our legislature to be removing barriers basically you know whether that's increasing the number of doctors available uh doctors and nurses and medical staff available by relaxing or you know changing some of the requirements etc and processes as you described last time or this kind of thing, you know, a certain amount of your job is really kind of clearing the path right. for the things that need to happen. Um, I want to ask you a tough question, um, and that is, you mentioned that cuts will have to happen, and you mentioned what your own priorities are. Can you give us an example of a cut to a program or programs that you could live with? Um, versus, you know, the, the kinds of protections you want to make sure are either uh, continue to be strong or are further strengthened? The first place I would look at is tax loops, loopholes. I would be looking at any area where we have uh, provided somebody a tax break or a tax, in, you know, tax incentive. And I would say, do we really need that? Um, I would be closing some of those loopholes. Um, our tax system is 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 problematic. Um, we don't have a ability to have a graduated income tax. Um, I know that a lot of these loopholes are there to to mitigate, um, you know, business taxes, which frankly in Massachusetts we don't have a very high business tax. Um, because we brought it down over the course of years. So I would, but I would really look at that. I would look at, um, at, uh, at tax loopholes first and see what we can close to bring in more, um, to bring in more revenue. Um, I can't think of a program offhand that I would say, hey, we need to, we should cut that. Um, I know, and that's, I mean, obviously that's anathema in a sense, you know, asking you to, to state on record in, in any sense. Uh, I get that, but with respect, I, it feels like closing tax, tax loopholes is not, it, that's not gonna so, address, you know. Right, so I think the issue more becomes more is how do we cut, okay? Making a cut to one program is not the same as making a cut to another. So if you reduce um, across the board cuts by 28%, let's say, that's very different. For instance, a 28% cut to, um, to local aid, for instance, is very different than a 28% cut to the Department of Public Health. Okay, first of all, Local aid is really is really weird because, um, for lack of a better word, you know, 
everybody gets a different amount of local aid. And some towns really, really depend on that aid because they have no other sources of income. And some towns get so little, their feeling is, eh, cut it, right? Or, I mean, they don't want it to be cut, but it's like, oh, we'll be fine, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then at the other hand, if you cut DPH, Department of Public Health, which we desperately need right now by 28%, you will be doing enormous damage because we've been cutting DPH by 28% and 50% and 10% for the past 20 years. Wow. So that's what I'm talking about is like, how do you make those decisions so that we need DPH? We cannot have them cut right now. They are doing a critical piece of work to keep the entire Commonwealth, you know, alive. And we need to make sure they have the procedures and protocols and infrastructure in place so that we can deal with the pandemic. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wouldn't be comfortable just saying 28% across the board, for instance. I'm making that up, okay? That's, I think, mm -hmm. what we cut uh, during the 2009-2010. That's what I'm talking about. So it's not just I'm going to cut the, I'm, I'm going to cut you and not cut you. It's how much we're going to cut and what can we put in place instead you know if we're going to cut you what do we do mm -hmm. right but um i so that's why i can't just say no you you know cut this program but save this program yeah um it's more nuanced than that so i'm not trying to get out of it i'm just trying because i don't it's not in front of me um so i can't say yeah i'm going to cut that um Right. Fair, fair enough. And, and thanks for tackling that as you usually, as you always do, you know, kind of head on. We appreciate it. Um, but you mentioned uh, 2009, 2010 just now. And um, I am mindful uh, or I, I, I want to ask you, um, <laughs> is there anything that you and the rest of the legislature who were there and dealing with that, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, um, anything useful that you are going to be applying to the kinds of negotiations and tough choices and things like that that are coming up? Um, or is the fact that it was a completely different set of drivers and things that you needed to deal with mean that it's not as relevant or helpful in terms of, you know, again, tackling what you've got in front of you? I don't know that I can um, intelligently answer that question because I don't really, I, I don't know all the details and the ins and outs. And, um, you know, I, I just, it, it, I wasn't really involved. And right, also, of course you, right. So yeah. it, it's just hard for me to, to answer that. I mean, we, we do use it as a kind of, as a comparison point. Um, the other piece of it is, is that was a economic downturn. This is a right. health, right? Yeah. This is being driven by um, health versus the economy. Um, although some people will argue that this was coming anyway because we, you know, because our economy was so fragile. Um, but there is a real difference, and I don't know how that manifests itself. Um, right. I know. Right. This is this. You know, I, I think that you know my thinking or whatever. I understand your answer for sure. Um, I was wondering because this is a health-induced uh, or you know health-focused uh, crisis that then leads into an economic crisis is what it sure feels like to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. That I'm just wondering whether you know that there would have been lessons drawn from the, you know, the economic recovery programs that did work and didn't work, et cetera. But fair enough, as you said, um, that wasn't your direct experience. I'm sure time. somebody's looking. I'm sure a lot of people are looking. <laughs> yeah. Um, Greater minds than mine. Yeah. I have no doubt. Um, one of the things we were asking you about in our last conversation, because we were curious, was just how, how you're getting business done with everybody being remote. Um, I'm wondering with the budget negotiations, you know, or the working out of the budget still in front of you, um, and the many other things that, that, you know, require exigent attention on your part, um, and, and this 
the governor's four phases. Are you guys going to be getting back to work at the state house anytime soon? If not, is it, are the current procedures and, and, and practices and ways you're doing business and getting and getting legislation passed? Are, are they going to be adequate for what it, for for what you need to do going forward? I think there's a number of answers to that. The first one I uh, would point out is that the Senate has done a lot of legislation in the past couple of months. We have excuse me, two municipal bills. We have a um, UI bill that we've done. Um, we did a, a, a scope of practice bill. Um, there's a whole number of bills that we've done. And um, so again, go to the website and you'll see that we've been pretty busy. Uh, we, it, it's, it's working well enough to get things that we have to get done done. It's not the way we all like to do business. Um, I know that the House has come up with a um, mechanism for having formal sessions, um, and the Senate has a temporary way of doing that. That's how we passed the, the remote borrowing bill. Um, or, um, excuse me, the borrowing bill. Um, but we are looking at a, a long-term solution to being able to do formal sessions in the way that um, allows people to um, file amendments, have debates, um, you know, mirror as much as we can what our usual way of doing business is. And I think we're going to be coming out with that in the next couple of weeks. Um, in the meantime, um, we do all of our work on, you know, in the caucuses, which we have every week. Um, the Senate president and the minority leader work very closely together so that whenever something comes out, it's got, um, it, it's got the support of the body. Um, but we're going to have to change that. I mean, we're going to have to go back to business. Um, mm -hmm. as and so do you have any sense of when you may return to business in something that looks and feels a little bit more, you know, the normal way that things were done? Uh, and by that, I mean, looks that way to you and feels that way to you on the inside, also looks that way to us on the outside. I think it's going to be a while. Uh, you know, as the governor said, he, as everyone keeps saying, if you're over 60, don't leave your house, right? Um, there's a number of people in the legislature that are over <laughs> um, so, um So right there, you've got this, um, the, the kind of rub of how we, how we do that. Um, I think people are really anxious to get back to work. It, not... I, I think people are really anxious to get back to business the way it was. Um, but we have to be really careful. And I think we have to model good behavior. And I, I, I want people to know that we have not been uh, conducting business as usual, but we have never been busier. Like so many people, um, we are, I mean, so many of, my colleagues and I go from 7.30 in the morning to, to late at night. Um, one of the downsides of Zoom is that you're always available. That's you right. Say, oh, <laughs> good I'm for sorry. us, not so good for you. Right. I'm in Bill Ricca. I can't get back to the State House for that meeting. Um, so there's been a lot of work that's been going on. And, um, and I have to say that one of the... Um, upsides of this is that there's been a lot of bipartisan work that's gone on between the governor and the legislature and between Senate uh, Democrats and Republicans. And that has been really um, heartening. To yeah, you talk about, you know, you were just saying in terms of returning to work, you got to model good behavior. Uh, well, there's, there's a great example, right? right? Would, right. would that some of that would seep upwards or yeah. outwards? you know, out from here, that that would be very, very nice indeed. Um, and that, you know, brings me to one of the last topics I've got for you, which is, uh, you already described the situation, I think, quite accurately as a series of, uh, well, my interpretation was a series of kind of uh, municipal or bodies or govern, governance units, starting with local towns and cities who are dependent on the decisions, budget decisions made by the state. The state in turn is dependent 
to on making those decisions on what happens at the federal level. So how, so my question is, we've got the CARES Act already working its way through and, and, and that money, as you said, is making its way slowly to where it was intended to go. Um, then we have some pending possible legislation, a HEROES Act uh, that has been you know, introduced by the House Democrats, or by the House, um, uh, US House. Um, how how uh, important, how vital is whatever is still to, to come from the, from the federal government to your calculations you know, as you work out the budget for the state? Are, 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 we, are we waiting really on decisions to be made um, still in order before you guys can actually come up with a 2021 budget? We are waiting. Um, there's no question about it, but we can't wait for very long. Um, <clears throat> I think what you'll see is that there'll be a, a, a probably a short-term budget that will come out in the end of July, and then in the fall there'll be a, a, a longer budget once you know a, 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 a more complete budget <clears throat> for 2021 um, uh, in the fall, uh, uh -huh. as we understand or at some point realize that something is or isn't going to happen. So I think that's how we'll, I think that's how it will be addressed. Um, and the, and the, the interim budget or the, the budget that, you know, the first one that comes out smaller as it may be, small as it may be, that's, that's going to be, how is that, how do, how will you decide what the contents of that budget are? Is it have to do with the, the, the essential quality of the programs that you're going to be funding usually, there? When we do a, Sometimes you hear about a one twelfth budget, which is a month by month. Um, we do that when we're still negotiating. It happens sometimes, but usually the way that it works is that it's based on last year's uh, budget for that month. So you're basically level funding things. Um, you're keeping it at the level of last year. So you see how we can't do that for very long, right? Um, because we're going to have such a um, have, have such a deficit, but that's why it's short term, and that's probably what will happen. Um, and then we'll have to make it up with the longer term, you know, with the more complete budget. But that's you, that's how it works, and I haven't gotten any indication that it, <clears throat> it will be done differently. So, in other words, I don't think we'll start to cut in August. Okay. Well, we have taken up just about enough of your 7.30 in the morning to whatever 10.30 <laughs> schedule today. Um, but let me ask, you know, I, I want to invite you as I did last time I spoke to you. Um, extraordinary circumstances, we continue to work our way through kind of somewhat blindly, somewhat uh, in, in, in tandem and cooperation and collaboration with each other, et cetera. Um, Final words, uh, you know, for Arlington, for your constituency, um, you know, around where we are and, and where we're headed. Everybody follow the guidelines for keeping safe. Social distancing, wear a mask, it matters, it matters, it matters. Um, I hope everybody votes on June 6th. Um, in Arlington, I know we all got cards from the um, town clerk saying you can vote by mail, so get your vote in. If nothing, if we haven't learned anything, we've learned that leadership really, really matters in these times, and that's leadership at every level, so make your voice heard. And um, keep taking deep breaths, and I, People have been, for the most part, absolutely wonderful and thoughtful and kind. And I just, I beg you to keep patient, um, keep optimistic, ask for help when you need it. And we are, we are here to help. So it's cindyfriedman.org and you can call my office anytime. Uh, we answer, we, we pick up our messages constantly during the day. 617-722-1432. And um, I'm very glad that I live in Arlington in the state of Massachusetts. So 
Thank you, James. Well, thank you. Wise words. And guess what? You, those, those are numbers you're clearly in command of. Your, your telephone number, no problem. Finishing on, on a high note. <laughs> no, it's been, again, we, we really do appreciate it. We know that you are exceedingly busy and um, doing your part, both individually and collectively, to help us uh, all get through this. And we'll do our part. So well, you, um, I am one of the many, many, many people who are doing their part. So thank you too. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, I have been speaking to our state senator, Cindy Friedman, and um, this is Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us.